Oh, well, he's very popular, Ed. The sportos, the motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wasteoids, dweebies, dickheads. They all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. That is why I have got to catch him this time. To show these kids that the example he sets is a first-class ticket to nowhere. Oh, Ed, you sounded like Dirty Harry just then. Really? Uh-huh. Uh, today is October the 2nd of 2018. Uh, it's 7 o'clock Eastern Time. My friend Mark Sargent from Seattle is here to join us tonight. And I believe he'll give us some insight and understanding and descriptions of um, what he thinks of our our Earth being a flat plane. Um, that's all I have to say. Mark, it's all yours. Just go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent. I currently live up in Seattle, Washington, and I am a flat earth believer. I started this back in about the summer of 2014. That's when I first looked at it. And what, how I got into it was really just conspiracy boredom more than, more than anything else. I thought I'd looked at just about every conspiracy you could ever think of. I had started looking. I was kind of a late bloomer, so I didn't even really didn't even believe that people lied uh, on a higher level until I got out of university. I, you know, I was I grew up pretty sheltered, pretty pretty safe environment, and then I happened to stumble across a video by a German guy in the summer of 2014 that was saying, "Yeah, the flight paths in the southern hemisphere don't make any sense." The, the connections are all out of whack. They're all going north, and they're way longer than they should be. And there's all these capital cities that don't even have direct flights between each other, you know, between like South America and Africa and, and, and um, Australia. I thought, that's an interesting story. And he said, well, it doesn't make sense unless you, unless you look at the world like it's flat, like it's, a, uh, like it's a dinner plate instead of a globe. And I go, okay, that's, that's, that's not bad. But, it, you know, I'm not convinced. And, you know, I hated it. Like everybody that gets into flat earth, I hated it. So I was poking around a little bit and I ran into another guy from Canada who said that he knew some guys in NASA and that he overheard at a uh, at a party years and years ago that GPS doesn't work in the southern hem you know when you get way down uh, supposedly to Antarctica GPS doesn't work down there because the world is flat and it's like okay yeah it's a pretty intriguing story i i think i can stomp it out in uh, in the course of a weekend it's not it's not hard everybody knows flat earth is ridiculous all the other conspiracies are way more credible than this thing, and everybody knows about Flat Earth. It's the the book on the shelf you're never going to read. It's the DVD was given to you for Christmas you're never going to watch. And so I did the worst thing I ever could, and I spent a weekend trying to debunk Flat Earth. Fast forward about nine months later, I'm sitting in Boulder, Colorado at my computer, and I realize that I, I can't... I, I can't, I can't debunk it anymore. I, every, every string, every thread I pulled, every rock I tried to turn over just led to more and more things to where I, I woke up in the middle of the night, uh, in the, like February 10th, uh, 2015. And I said, okay, I'm going to go the other direction on this. I'm going to, because I, I can't solve this on my own. Obviously it was bigger than me. And I put, made a series of videos and I called them the Flat Earth Clues and I put them up on YouTube one at a time. And it's basically a, a cry for help more than anything else. It was a request to the internet hive mind, which said, okay, I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. Not, not even close. I can create massive reasonable doubt in it. Tell me where I'm wrong because I think the world is this flat infinite plane and it's enclosed by some sort of superstructure, and that's when everything just started going downhill from there. Uh, not only were academics not calling me and telling me where I went wrong, but I had all these people calling me and, and telling me where I went right. Um, people from all walks of life, all branches of the military, um, engineers, uh, and anybody that had to do anything with flight, air traffic controllers, pilots, uh, shipping guys, people that had anything to do with travel, they all said the same thing. They said, yeah, we've all heard about the curvature of the earth and we've all heard about the spin of the earth. Nobody practices the, the math though in real life. It's just, it's just something we're hurt. We, we've been told. And so you know, here we are um, a couple years later 
and we've had hundreds of meetups in the United States and Canada. We've had conferences in all sorts of different countries. In fact, we're uh, doing the second major U.S. conference next month in Denver, Colorado. And the the short version is this: it's, uh, you know, if anyone's listening, is that the where you thought you lived for the longest time, you thought you lived on this tiny little ball that's spinning through space at unbelievable speeds in multiple directions. But in reality, you're living in a building, a big box, lack of a better term, uh, with, with, with walls and a floor and a ceiling, uh, no different than a, a giant Hollywood uh, sound studio. Uh, but the difference here is that it is so huge, it is so massive that even our best and our brightest couldn't figure out until around 1960 what exactly the dimensions were. Even they didn't know for sure until around 1960. And when they found out, a decision had to be made, which was, do you tell everybody? And that's where it all, you know, that's that's where we are now, to where it's like, would you have told everybody back back then? No. And once you start that lie, you had to keep it going. And so NASA was created. Uh, the moon missions were fabricated. Everything, every every story you ever hear about space is all about one thing. It's about the subtext. They don't even care if you read the article. All they care is you look at the headline and maybe glance at the picture. Something funny on Mars, that's because you're living on a globe. Something on Saturn, globe. Pluto is renamed, globe. We're sending probes out everywhere. Well, that's because you're on a globe. Nothing could be further from the truth. So there's my, my quick summary of uh, where where we are. Um, Mark, I think you're doing great. Um, very intense, very brief. Um, would you comment about your thinking on uh, if we went to the moon or not? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it, and when people ask me that, they say, you know, do you believe in the moon missions? I I like to answer, like, the, the line from uh, Tom Cruise used in Miss, Mission Impossible. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, it's way worse than what you think. And that is not only is did we not go to the moon, the Mercury, Gemini and Apollo programs were completely fabricated, but the entire reason NASA was created in 1958 was to keep this thing locked down for as long as possible. That was it. And by that, I mean, you had to build once you figured out where the outer boundaries, outer boundaries were to this place, once you figured out where the walls were. And then you kind of figured out where the ceiling was, you had to seal those things off. And the, the biggest fear there was you didn't want to let the private corporations get involved. You didn't want to let companies, because remember, NASA doesn't really build anything. They're a conglomeration of all these different giant companies like uh, General Dynamics and Boeing and um, Hewlett Packard and, you know, massive, massive companies that, that build, you know, a lot of, of, of parts for these things. And so they decided you they said they did two things very, very quickly. And I'll, I'll get to the other one later. Um, uh, the first thing they did was they sealed off Antarctica for all time. But the second thing was they militarized space. And in order to, in doing doing that to militarize space, you have to it, this answered a question for me that had bugged me for a long time because there's lots of Americans and of course a lot of people outside of the United States that have always had their doubts about the Apollo program and the moon program. But I never could come up with a good enough reason why 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 are you doing it for the money uh, to raise the flag and say go go you know go team go you know go fight win that sort of thing. It, those are pretty good reasons, but then when you got into the flat earth, then it became more evident, which was, oh, okay, they didn't fake it because they wanted to fake the moon missions. They had to. You had to keep, you had to make the moon a non-starter. You had to make the moon this blasé routine thing. So they went six times really, really fast, even though statistically the, the odds of them pulling this off was one in a million. And they just kept, you know, they kept going back, went through the Van Allen belts, had not a single problem with it. And then they, they, in 1972, they said, well, it's getting boring. You know, the ratings are down. There's no reason for us to go anymore. That's it. Good night, everybody. And that's it. They just shut the whole thing down and they never went back and neither did any other country. No other country even tried. You know, the would have thought the Soviet Union would have kept on going, but they didn't. And China didn't go and the Europeans didn't go and Japan and all these other countries. Nobody's, nobody's ever been. Only the Americans can say they've been. And they went six times and nobody even uh, other than us even attempted it no no plus uh the big there's there's so many i could i could 
I could spend all day on the moon missions, but I'll give you some quick bullet points if you're looking at the moon missions. <clears throat> uh, the first of which is uh, intersecting shadows. That's probably the most obvious, which is we all know that shadows only go in one direction you, because there's only one light source. Right? One light source, the shadows only go in one direction. Parallel lines. They never intersect, ever, ever, ever. And when you look at the moon photos, because they were shot by whoever was, you know, whoever was lighting it, they wanted to make some beautiful pictures, they ignored the physics, because we don't teach physics very often to people. And when they did that, it created intersecting shadows. That's, that's the first one. Second one would be the blast crater. There is no blast crater. You know, you, you can see by all the, the, the cool photography that we, there was like a heavy, heavy ash type scenario where you could, you could step in footprints. You know, it was like, it was really like, like volcanic ash. And yet when this thing touched down with what, 10,000 foot pounds of thrust, there wasn't uh, a speck of dust anywhere, any of the, um, uh, uh, foot pads around it. Uh, no feats of strength, no vertical jump. Again, remember, they say the moon is one sixth the Earth's gravity. So, a 180 pound man would only weigh 30 pounds, but yet still have all his muscles. Uh, white man can't jump. Oh, they can, can on the moon, but you never saw it. Uh, you know, if even if you had an 18 inch vertical jump in a spacesuit, and that's not that, that's not saying that's much. These guys were in peak physical condition, they should have been able to jump six feet straight up and you never saw it not even close and not only just straight up they should have been bounding over things uh you know you speed up the the footage by by 2x and it looks like they're just running by the way i'm getting some feedback on your side guys don't know why now it's now it's better yeah now it's better uh, so yeah, the, the moon, I'm, but, I'm not sure where the setting comes from, but we'll just keep going. No, no, no worries. It's gone now. So, um, the, the biggest thing about the moon missions, which I throw at people and it's one of my five questions that I, I throw at scientists on a regular basis, which is, uh, the Van Allen belt question, which is more of a trap. It's, it's kind of a loop back on itself. And if you want to shut down anyone when it comes to the moon missions, uh, you can, you can give them two questions. This one's probably the the easiest of the two which is are the van allen radiation belts deadly yes or no it's just a yes or no question van allen radiation belts were which were announced in 1959 by van allen from nasa uh lethal bands of radiation between us and the moon you know very very thick up to like 60,000 miles thick if you believe him and and he announced them in 59 before the apollo program was even announced remember nasa wasn't even founded until 1958 and then in 1961, Kennedy says, oh, yeah, we're going to go to the moon in this decade, blah, blah, blah. And they went back to Van Allen and say, hey, how are these guys going to get past the belts? And he literally, I, I could not make this if I tried to go. They're going to go real fast. It's like, really? Because our best speed is, what, 17,000 miles an hour, even now, if you believe it. That uh, means three plus hours each way through those things. Round trips through the Van Allen belts. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning nobody even got cancer there's five astronauts still alive today of the apollo program we never see it and so the question is are they deadly yes or no if they say yes they are deadly then ask tell ask me or find out what shielding they used on the capsules because there's only two metals common metals that can block radiation one of which is lead and the other is gold which is twice as dense as dense as lead the problem with lead and gold is that they're dense they're really really heavy the last thing you would ever do is put an anchor on top of a rocket and in fact and they knew this and so they didn't put any shielding they used aluminum and plastic aluminum and plastic do not stop radiation so how did the Van Allen belts get defeated? There's no answer for that. They have no answer. And if they say, well, no, they're not lethal. They're not, they're not lethal at all. And people have told me that. I go, okay, fine. Go to the NASA website. You can go to nasa.gov. You can look this up online. It's real easy. It's not secret information. Just type in Orion trial by fire, which is the Mars program. When it was a video they made a few years back where they said that they will be testing the capsules unmanned for the Mars program for a while because they can't figure out how to solve the Van Allen radiation problem, which is a bit surprising since they already solved it perfectly back in the 1960s. So what's the difference between the 1960s and now? They, they won't say. 
so they are deadly. So there's no there's no way to win that argument. It's like, okay, if you say they're deadly, then okay, where are the shielding? If you say they're not deadly, well, no, 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 NASA has already said on their website, it's right, right there right now, uh, that they are deadly. And this was a video that was made at the end of 2014. And they were very specific about it, too. I mean, you know, they, they, they did a lot of special effects saying, oh, super deadly, and we're not going to put people in these capsules. It's like, why, why would you do that? Um, the second thing, if you want to, if you want to completely crush, not just the Apollo program or the moon program, but all programs, uh, space programs, I don't care if it's JAXA or the Europeans or the Chinese or the Russians or uh, the Israelis or India, it doesn't really matter. They all will fall victim to the same thing because they all blueprinted off NASA. They're all faking it the same way. And that is, um, tell me how, or again, tell you. How does a spacesuit stop the vacuum of space? How does an astronaut suit stop the, the vacuum of space? You say, well, that doesn't, I, I don't get it. Okay, okay, imagine you're holding in your hand a basketball. It can be anything. It could be a volleyball, a soccer ball, a football. It doesn't matter, as long as it's inflated, right? Why, does a basket, why is a basketball tight, right? Why is it tight? Why, why can't you, you, you press on the sides of it? Why can't you burst it? And uh, it's like, well, it's got, it's under pressure. You know, there's a lot of pressure in there. And it's like, okay, well, what is pressure? You know, it's just a little more atmosphere inside the ball than outside of it. It's not very hard. This is really, really basic physics, right? Uh, it's balloon physics, which is higher pressure inside, lower pressure outside. It's trying to balance out. So that higher pressure is trying to get out. So the basketball is really, really tight. And you see that with everything that we blow up, whether it's a balloon or a parade float or whatever piece of sporting equipment you want, they all do the same thing. Even weather balloons do the same thing. There's only one soft container of air I've ever seen in my life that doesn't act like a balloon in a vacuum. And that's a spacesuit. How? How, how is this possible? It's not. The, uh, you ask any any scientist, anyone that studies physics at all, and that is that that no soft, but, and that's all an astronaut suit is. It's just a thick bag of air, just a thick balloon. That's all it is. How does it stay pliable in a vacuum when the force should be ripping at it from all sides? That, that those astronauts shouldn't be able to move their arms or legs at all. They certainly shouldn't be able to move their fingers, and yet they're doing complex electronics and building a car and setting up satellite dishes and doing all sorts of stuff. All their articulation points are perfect, and yet they're and, – and here's, here's how I know I'm absolutely 100% right with this – is that I can't even think of a fictional technology that would stop that pressure equalization from happening, meaning fi tell me – and, and – Tell me what, today, tell me what technology is there that keeps an astronaut suit pliable. There is no magical technology that, that'll do this. And, and even if you could convince me that it's, it's microprocessor technology, and blah, 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 okay, fine. Even if you could convince me today, which you wouldn't be able to, tell me how they did in 1969. Tell me how all the uh, uh, recordings, the audio recordings of the astronauts bouncing around the moon, not one of them was talking about their oxygen levels. Not one was talking about the suit pressure. Not one seemed to be worried when they fell on the ground. You would think of the, the slightest sharp rock. They would be constantly checking their suit. Constantly. And yet they never did. It was it was the greatest oversight I've ever seen. And you can see this when they're... Um, uh, they're testing the, the the early suits. They knew this was a problem back in the in the late fifties, early sixties. They absolutely knew it was a problem. You see the movies of them doing their hybrid suits because they knew a soft container couldn't do it. So they were working with plastics and metals and all this stuff. They were trying to make basically uh, like a di deep sea diving suit, only you know because they, they were trying to make a, a hard shell. And eventually they just gave up and somebody in the meeting, it was brilliant. They said, you know what, let's just go with the soft suit. No one's going to notice. Let's just shoot the footage and be done with it. And they did. And they've kept that going to this day, even though no one will ever be able to, there is no such technology. It was never in the backpacks. It's never in the tethers. It's, it's not there even now. The, it, the technology does not exist. And what's your point? The point is, is that if the astronaut suit does not work, then anything that's ever shown an astronaut suit does not work. Any, any mission that's ever shown anyone in an astronaut suit is absolutely a lie from minute one. So, sorry, that's my, my little rant. I, I tend to go on those.
I, I, I'm big on the spacesuit concept, too. I believe certainly they couldn't have moved their fingers and even their arms. They would have looked like Doughboy or the Michelin Man. Yeah. They would have been super inflated, even if they weren't in a vacuum. Even if it was just low pressure, there's a pressure difference, and right. the suit would be stretching outward. Right. That's that's a total... A total uh, which which doesn't mean they didn't go to the mean. It simply means that none of the footage or photos or videos we've seen showed that condition. Right. So uh, I, well, a way I would say it is that the public has never seen any evidence that they did go. No. Um, all they've done is faked a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and and, and uh, l- let me build on that because you have a good point there. Not many people have done what you just did. And that is, does it prove that, that they went to the moon? No. Does it prove did, they didn't go to the moon? No. Uh, now, because some people uh, will say that there was a secret space program, right? That, uh, that we did everything right. in secret. And I'm going, okay, that's not, a bad, that's not a bad idea, but there's something that's missing. And that is, even if you have a secret space program, you're going to take pictures. And if anyone wants evidence of this, you all you have to do is go online and look up the blue marble shot of Earth. There was only one shot taken, literally, from 1972 up until the summer of 2015. One picture. And by that, I mean blue marble. The entire one half of the Earth shown in perfect sunlight in full disc form. And they did not take it during Apollo 9, 10, 11... All the way up through Apollo 16, they only took the picture on the way back f- during Apollo 17. It was really because you're you're not going to take a, there's no camera opportunities between now and then. You're literally going to wait till the last possible moment, knowing that no one, there is not going to be an Apollo 18, right? Even though there was a science fiction movie made on Apollo 18, uh, you never take the shot, and then you milk that shot. And you know you know what it is when you when you take a look at it. It shows two very interesting things. Even though it's an American space program, it shows the bottom part of Africa and the Antarctica in its entirety. It's like, really? Because the American space program would, would have a, a vested interest in taking a picture of the North American continent. And they didn't. So why didn't they? And then they milked that picture for years and years, decades, as a matter of fact. And, and I, I, can't, I can't overstate this. Meaning they milked this one picture through almost all of the 70s, all of the 80s, all of the 90s, and all of 2000 through 2010. And halfway through 2010 to 2020, it was only three years ago that they released the second blue marble shot and it was because of us we were asking i in fact i knew this and i wasn't even into flat earth back then i was in uh in 2000 when i was running a tech support company out of uh, boulder colorado the um i wanted to put iconic earth shots on all the monitors right and and you know different shots for different monitors and i was running as many boolean strings search strings as i could inside google and i could only come up with one image literally i'm not there's no exaggeration here one image because no one was even photoshopping earth back then and it's like how can this be you know I, i looked at the picture i'm literally seeing apollo 17 image in just different resolutions all over the place it's just the same picture i'm going nasa you suck you're terrible at this uh, you know, but couldn't see the forest for the trees. Didn't even get that the only reason that blue marble shot was out there was there were no other shots. And so and people say, well, you know, it's tough to take pictures sometimes. I'll go get, yeah, maybe, maybe every once in a while from month to month, not from year to year and definitely not between decade to decade. Uh, and you want to have, a, if you don't have just fun with that, uh, look at the black marble shots. You know, there's a blue marble shots and there's the black marble supposedly taken at night, you know, the dark side of the earth. And those were taken only well, fairly recently. And even those were fabricated to, to hell. The, um, the, my favorite part of the, the black marble shots was the Western part of Australia where they, um, uh, they showed, you know, like like a big city complex in the west, west you know, you know, they, they lit it up, you know, to where they showed major cities and the western part of Australia looked like there's these giant population centers out there. Well, there, there's no population out in the western part of Australia. It's all national parks. So why why are you putting in people where there's no people? And it was because they just gave creative license to whoever was making the images. And those people didn't know anything about geography. It's like, yeah, you, you might want to, instead of just dotting population centers wherever you think there's population, you might want to you know, correspond it to the actual cities. But anyway, so, sorry. Let me go back to your, your comment about they photographed Antarctica rather than North America. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the man who posed as an airline pal, a doctor and a lawyer in a movie, um, 
catch me if you can. I right. saw him speaking really re- recently, yeah. and he was explaining that he, he pretended he was a Pan Am pilot, but he always rode on other airlines. He never rode on Pan Am directly because somebody on Pan Am might ask him something specific about their own aircraft that he would know. Ah. So he would ride on others. So photographing Antarctica rather than North America, we know North America. We would see flaws there, but we don't know the other side of the world very well, so flaws are not so obvious. You know, that's excellent. That's very, very good. Also, got to remember, the uh, the continents that they really wanted to show. I mean, really, they only showed one continent It's in, in its entirety, which was Antarctica which, of course, was what they were trying to reinforce because they right. wanted to let people know, oh, yeah, by the way, here's Antarctica in its entirety. It's kind of it's an island continent, sort of like Australia, but you don't have to worry about it. It's covered in snow. No one ever needs to go there. And then, of course, in 1959, they lock it down. The same year they announced the Van Allen radiation belts, that which was the upper edge, they, they created the Antarctic Treaty, which, again, no one knows. You ought to look it up. The Antarctic Treaty says no corporation can ever set up shop down in Antarctica. It doesn't matter what country you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Ever. Forever. For all time. Meaning it's, it, it's the only treaty in the history of treaties that's never been broken. And it's not even up for debate until 2041. And it's, it's, it's staggeringly uh, ironclad, meaning it doesn't matter if your country wants the resources. And, and here's the part that really, really bugged me when I was looking at Antarctica. It wasn't just that it, was, it locked all these countries down and all the countries agreed upon it. You know, it were, you know China and Russia and England and South Korea. You know, if you, if you become an economic power, they put this piece of paper in front of you and they say, oh, yeah, by the way, you have to sign this. What's it say? Oh, you can't go down to Antarctica. Well, how long? Ever. Right. It's not that 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 part was, you know, that part was bad enough, but you're not even allowed to talk about it. That's the part that bugged me. You know, there's special interest groups. There's lobby groups. If I run British Petroleum and there's oil down there, if, if you believe Admiral Byrd, you know, there's oil. Uh, I'm going to be running full page ads in the London Times every week, you know, paying the money and paying off journalists and saying how great I would be spin spinning this thing and saying how great. It would be to have British Petroleum down in Antarctica. You never see those stories. You never see a single country protest the treaty. It's absolutely rock solid. Nobody gets to go there. And that's just the first level of it. The second level is you can't, you know, if, if you want to spend the money to go down there, you, the tours are guided. You are not allowed to roam freely. Uh, even the private person, you, you can't just grab a, a snowmobile team and just start running amok out there. They're not going to let that happen. And it's, it's, the reason is because Antarctica isn't an island continent. It is this giant, giant continent that stretches around this entire thing like the edge of a lake. And it probably goes in thousands of miles, long enough that Admiral Byrd was flying around looking for it for almost 30 years before he figured it out. So. I can't find the uh, the pilot, the um, captain, and or the mission at the moment. But I think that two separate British naval um, groups circumvented, circumscribed Antarctica to see if they could find any represent. And it took them three years and sixty five thousand miles. It's not the continent on the bottom of the globe. It's the outer ring of the known existence. Right, right, right. It is. Yeah, it is a. It is a very. By the way, it is the most unique continent. Out of all the continents and land masses that we have, most of our land masses, you know, they, they follow similar patterns, right? You know, there's mountains and valleys and hills and everything. Not Antarctica, though. Even the parts they release to us are ridiculously alien in nature, meaning uh, when you get to the coastline, it's a 200 foot wall of ice, pretty much straight up. You know, it's really tough to find a beachhead. I mean, the beachhead is very, very limited. It's like only one or two spots. The rest of it is this, this big wall of ice. Not as high as like Game of Thrones high, but it's really, really high. And then when you get on top of this thing, it starts sloping up really, really quick. When you look, you know, it looks like it's really, really flat, right? Well, it's only flat because they had to climb up. Most of the continent is over 14,000 feet high. It's this giant, really, really high plateau covered in snow and ice. And... Altitude sickness starts kicking in around 7,000 feet. Uh, and by the time you're up at 14,000, a lot of people need oxygen tanks. And it continues that way. And then there's mountains that are around 20,000 feet, 25,000 feet. And it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, the whole place just screams, go away. It's like this natural reinforcement barrier to keep us 
from going there. And why wouldn't it? I mean, very, very few people have ever said they've gone to Antarctica. And most of them have only taken the penguin tour where you just go to the coast and you get on some rafts and you go, you have your picture taken next to some icebergs and that's it. And though, even those are ridiculously expensive. Most of them cost over about 10, 12,000 American. And uh, there's no animals or plant life there. There's nothing to sustain you. you no, no. So if, if you went in, if you had to explore the place, I mean, think about it. If you're if you're trying to explore this thing back in the oh, I don't know, the 1800s, you have to bring with you all your own stuff unless you're eating penguins. And even then, you know, those are only on the coast for the most part. Uh, there's no, yeah, there's no indigenous animal life, no plant life, no, uh, no old civilizations. There's no, there's no nothing. I mean, you have to take everything in with you. And you know, it's, again, it, the place, it feels like a giant, uh, very, not even subtle, uh, go away sign, you know, stay out. Uh, it, it, if the cold doesn't get you, the lack of resources will, if that doesn't get you, the altitude will, if that doesn't get you, the fact that there's nothing, you know, in front of you, uh, you know, there's very little to get your bearings on. There's huge expanses, the, the size, you know, th th hundreds, if not thousands of miles wide that you, there, you get no bearings on. Uh, and it wasn't until, which is why we didn't even know. We did not know what this place really was until about 1960, because until the internal combustion engine was made you know, in the early 1900s, until you had planes, you had no way of, of exploring this place. And that's where they sent Admiral Byrd. They sent their best guy, Admiral Byrd, uh, Admiral of the United States Navy, uh, in 19, 1928 from up until his death in 1957. They just had him flying around there. Every year, they just had him flying in circles around Antarctica, trying to figure out where, what the shape of this thing was. And then they almost gave up in 1954, which, which is why we've got that great footage where he comes on television and says, oh, yeah, you know, I think they gave up. They said, OK, well, the place is obviously big. Let's just make money because nobody's going to figure out what's going on anyway. And that's you know and then the very next mission operation deep freeze which was 1955 to 1956 that's when he found it and that's when the whole thing shut down everybody all the countries that were on the ice at the, at the same time and i mean great britain and argentina and chile and new zealand and australia and the soviet union they all got off the ice simultaneously i've never seen a unilateral thing happen like that where everybody gets off the ice and, and agrees and everyone's saying yep nobody should go down there yep, we're not even going to talk about it anymore and they did they kept it out of sight for the longest time and to where now even now today you know 2018 uh, only the military military science uh and people under very specific conditions get, get to go there and on top of that nobody owns it find me another piece of real estate anywhere that isn't owned by somebody that's just i mean that it's like the like the like the prairies in the united states before the gold rush where there's these huge tracts of land where you know people run out there with stakes and claim it that's antarctica nobody owns it there's all these countries that they they have like joint ownership where they own tiny little slivers of it but nobody really owns anything they just are all there it's uh, it's fascinating Mark, my idea about space is this. We haven't, to my knowledge, penetrated Antarctica to explore what's there. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone to the bottom of the oceans. No. And they just pretend they're going to Moon and Mars, et cetera, to, to, to be a distraction. Right. But if we can't even manage what's already here, how could we possibly be going out there? Yeah. And I believe that the firmament is a physical thing, perhaps. The Van Allen Belt may be related, but do you have thoughts on the firmament itself? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, the, um, you know, if, if this place is a structure, you know, with walls and a floor and a ceiling, then uh, the ceiling's got to be, I, I, I do believe in a ceiling. I know, you know, that 20 to 30 percent of the Flat Earth community don't believe in a dome. And I think that's mostly because they feel kind of claustrophobic. You know, it's like, well, it can't, it shouldn't be like a sports stadium. It should be like an open aired stadium where there isn't a roof on top of this. Well, thing. there was a period when uh, we were shooting rockets up with uh, explosives to try to penetrate the dome. Operation Fishbowl or something. Do you yeah. want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Operation Fishbowl, which was the United States and the Soviet Union 
Union almost immediately after Byrd got back from the uh, Operation Deep Freeze in Antarctica. The United States and Soviet Union, which were the only two groups that had atomic weapons at the time, started launching their rockets straight up. And they did so from 1958 up until 1961, a year, you know, year after year. That's all they did. They just kept shooting straight up. And the first shots were big. I mean, the first shots were megaton, you know, yield weapons. And megaton back in the late 1950s, that was an expensive proposition. You know, it's not like today where you can just get it at the drugstore. It was, it was a really hard to come by item. And so those first shots were, the, you know, you could tell right away if you look the, the, um, the the listings of the the shots that were taken those first shots were heavy megaton and they couldn't bust it and it's like okay well if if, if your megaton weapons aren't going to break through this thing uh then you might as well just map it out and so the rest of them after that point were kiloton weapons uh medium yield kiloton weapons and they just kept firing them over and over and there was no doubt in my mind what they were doing they were trying to create the shape they were painting the sky it was like taking a paintball gun and firing them, you know, firing it into a room and uh, like a dark room, you know, taking glow in the dark paintballs and firing them into a dark room and seeing where they landed. And it's like, oh, okay, we, we know there's a wall over there and we know there's a wall over there. And they had to do this because if they were going to do a space program, they had to know where their rockets were going to crash. So at this point, that's why the rockets always go horizontal so quickly. You know, they, they fire the rockets up, at, you know, it's vertical for a while, and then they lean them over, and then they go horizontal, and they crash them out into the ocean. Because if you didn't do that, eventually the rockets would crash, and the people would see them crash. And if you had them crashing at a consistent altitude, people would be like, huh, I wonder why they're crashing at that particular altitude, however many miles up it is. So, uh, the, yeah, it, is the firmament real? The firmament that's talked about in, in uh, Genesis, uh, separating the, the waters above and the waters below? Yeah, I, I absolutely do believe it's real. And I know that other people in the scientific community do, too. Uh, the most prominent would be Admiral Werner von Braun, you know, the father of NASA, literally the, 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 the rocket scientist. <laughs> You know, when you hear about those rocket scientist jokes, that's the guy. That, that's the rocket scientist joke. You know, he was the, you know, that we got him from Nazi Germany. And yet on, and we brought him over here and he ran NASA through multiple presidents, through uh, Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson and Nixon. And he, when he died, uh, his headstone, you can look it up, look up Werner von Braun's headstone. It lists the year he was born, the year he died, and it says Psalm 191. And it's like, I didn't know what Psalm 19 one was. I mean, I know chapter and verse every once in a while, but I don't know that one. And it's like, okay, what is it? And Psalms 19 one says, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Uh, tell me why the father of NASA, the fa you know, the quintessential scientist, rocket scientist, why he's talking about a domed structure over the earth. Why, why is he doing that? It's because he knew he's, he's basically given us breadcrumbs from the grave. Uh, it is is not in in certain circles in science they've been suspecting this, you know that there's some there's something going on that that they can't figure out. I mean, look, there's lots of problems with astronomy. Happens every day, you know. They don't the Big Bang. It's just a guesswork. You want to have fun? Look up dark matter, and see what the scientists have been dealing with for the last X number of years. They just keep pushing. It's what they keep trying to explain the universe, even though the universe keeps pointing back that we're the center of it. There you go. That's my thing. What other questions? Oh, he's making a sandwich. Where'd he go? He thought I was just going to keep talking. Mark, I think you're uh, you're doing great. Um, <laughs> I think we have several on the call, although I don't know who. If anybody has any questions or comments, just go ahead and speak. We're we're not in the house here. Yeah, please do. I I I. It's not often I get to do conference calls. I have a question. Sure. Um, I'm sort of new to this. I mean, nothing is impossible nowadays, uh, given the climate. But uh, what is the purpose of uh, why I hide guess, it? A flat Earth theory. Um, uh, how does it change the way we live? Is it just exposure that there's more fraud and lies no, it's uh, a, perpetrated? It, or no, no, no. Think of it. Think of it this way. Um, oh, well, of course, it, it, you know, that's always there. You know, everybody lies. There's there's lies in all sorts of different venues, whether it's entertainment or sports or business or politics or journalism or science uh, that that's always there. But this is this is bigger because it changes your 
outlook on life. And I know there's people probably listening going, well, uh, the, uh, it's not, you know, my, my spouse still hates me. My kids don't listen to me. I still go have to go to my terrible job tomorrow. It's not going to change, you know, my life, you know, if all of a sudden it becomes flat. It's like, well, it's not exactly true uh, because you it, it doesn't change it only because you don't believe in it yet. But everybody, it's all anyone would ever talk about for years if, if this this happened. And here's why there's there's three prongs to this and they're not very they're not very long. Um, first would be educational. Let's say, for example, it was revealed tomorrow. I don't know how it would be revealed, but let's say it was revealed tomorrow uh, that the earth was flat. Academics overnight, things would happen. Uh, every astronomy department, every astrophysics department, and every university would close their doors. That was it. That was, they do not reopen tomorrow. Uh, and every physical science other than that, be it geology, hydrology, archaeology, um, biology, take your pick. They have to be rebuilt literally from the ground up because the ground has now changed. Uh, everything that you ever, everything that science thought they knew would be put into question, which we'll get into in a second. That's just the academic part. Uh, economically, uh, world markets, you'd have to suspend trading for a couple months at the very least, just to figure out when the dust settled, what happened, you know, cause industries would rise and fall based off of this in information. Uh, not, not to be too kumbaya here, but let's say, you know, let's say we are in some giant snow globe or in some giant building, some giant sports stadium. Do you still go to war? With it, knowing everybody's in the same family, you know, or do you still poison the environment the way you do? Do you still commit hate crimes, sex crimes? Uh, do you still do all these things knowing that there's a higher power over you that might be looking over your shoulder? Not confirmed, mind you, but it's there's the possibility is now very much real. And, you know, do you still do these things? Do you still do these bad things? And of course, the last part would be spirituality. Uh, and and I, I can't, again, I can't over, over, um, uh, estimate this one, which is, uh, you're, you're, you know, science has been beating, uh, down religion with textbooks for the last 500 years and doing a pretty good job at it. And now all of a sudden science has to stop and backpedal because it's, because, you know, and, and I, and I, I put out calls in my, in my various videos saying, look, you know, religion has a responsibility here not to seek revenge. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there would be questions, you, regardless whether you're a religious person or not. You're going to go to science and say, okay, so you were wrong about something really important. Uh, what else are you wrong about? You're wrong about evolution, carbon dating, Big Bang Theory, dark matter, uh, all these things. Uh, there's a lot of scientific questions. You combine all those three things in there and then put those ideas into a meeting. Uh, it's always men. You know, this giant, you know, men of power behind the scenes, you know, when somebody says, eh, what's the worst that could happen? And then they start rattling off that sort of stuff. That's a short meeting where, you know, all of a sudden somebody at the head of the table goes, yeah, we're going to, we're going to put a pin in this for a while until we can figure out how to best disseminate it to the public. And it was an easy decision to make. I, honestly, even though I consider myself a truth seeker. You know, I, I I was trained to be in my career, trained to be empathetic, and I I would probably have done the same thing. You know, even if there's a, a five percent chance that the general public will run through the streets with torches and pitchforks, you gonna roll those dice? Are you? I don't know. I, I don't think I could at the time. I'd probably do the same thing. It's like okay, there's got to be a way that we can that we can gently put this into the public and get everybody on the same page, and that's where I think we are now. Um, 7 billion people and 6 billion smartphones. And we now have the ability literally to get everybody on the same page in a span of minutes. You know, it's just a question of how, you know, how often you check your phone and to where it's like, okay, they could spin this story in a certain way. And I, I think that's what they're kind of angling for right now. It's not like we just discovered this and we're releasing it to the public. This isn't, you know, some weird scandal. I think part of it is being allowed to happen. So hopefully that answers your question let, let me make a, a comment um yes most people would think that the flat earth is a, a a crazy argument it doesn't make any sense it doesn't have any meaning but right. to me i've looked at the federal reserve the corporations that are running our country as if they were governments right. just the deceptions all around us in medicine and history and law this i think is the single most um 
important deception at the very ground level. So to me it says if they are lying about the shape of the earth, well, what else are they lying about? Maybe I should get out of their control and their, my dependency on these people who are misguiding us because they lie for their purpose to have control over us. Yeah, it, so, uh, you're absolutely right. It opens it opens up everything. <laughs> Uh, in fact, it makes you revisit. It was so funny because I, you know, I, I was bored with conspiracies by the time I got to this. And I got to this, it's like, oh, man, I, I'm going to have to revisit every conspiracy I ever thought of because now, you know, and see how it connects in some way because they're all underneath it in, in, in some way, shape, or form because Flat Earth is literally the, the giant umbrella that's, that's over the entire thing. Um, Mark, I think a connection here is, however you want to say it, you could say spirituality, I would say God or Yahweh. I think the um, the Creator is near at hand, but they want us to think we're just a, a, a random a mud that evolved and we're in this vast uniform universe and we're not important. Right. But I think that the Creator comes right into this flat earth thing in a very fundamental way. I think you think so too, but express uh, that again. I, I do, I do. Um, as a matter of fact, I kind of dodged that question for a while when I was building the clues and the Christian community came to me pretty strongly and said, look, you're, you're tap dancing around the, the issue of God. Because if it is a flat enclosed structure, if it is a snow globe, a pizza box, uh, a petri dish, whatever you want to call it, then it's God's snow globe, right? It's God's petri dish. And because, again, if you take out the organic, what we call organic, you know, this little rock flying through space at impossible speeds, you know, precariously, you know, just flying around. If you take that away and you and you do introduce, you know, a, a domed like structure, well, then it's not organic. It was built by somebody. And it's really tough. I got to tell you, there's been a lot of people brought back to uh, spirituality because of this. Because, you know, an atheist, it's tough. Uh, even atheists are splitting hairs when they're, when they're looking. Even atheists will say, okay, fine, it was built, right? Obvious, you know, it's got floor and walls and a ceiling. It was built by somebody, but it doesn't have to be God. And I'm going, well, at that point, what are you talking about here? You know, one man's advanced civilization is another man's God. So, yeah, and so, which is why I made the clue. I literally called it hiding God. And, and that's what the ultimate, the ultimate goal of science, that's what they want. They're creating their own religion and they're trying to bury, if not kill God entirely. And, you know, of course they can't kill God, but they can do a nice, you know, power perceived is power achieved. And so that's what they, they can hide him. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. did a really great job at it to the point where we had so much is kind of ironic. We created so much technology to where, you know, if you're really into tech, you don't think about God much. You're not going to church a lot. I mean, I know. In fact, even it's even slipped in. I mean, not not that I'm against Bible tablets at church, but it does seem to take away from the whole experience. And so here here we are with Flat Earth and Flat Earth is being put through the system. It's being propagated through technology. So I, I think the uh, the justice there is 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 kind of fun. Mark, I, I just have a comment. Um, we all have information in our head, and it started even at their kindergarten, et cetera, about this globe thing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we build a life based on the information that we have. But now you and I know that we can go out and get different information. Right. To me, the whole flat earth thing is not so much is it true or not true, but have you the ability to simply hear an idea? Right. And, of course, many people, they just can't get into this discussion at all no. because they have so many things that are just standards to them they don't want to put in question. So they can't discuss it. They can't use these words. They can't look at the idea. Now, I don't care that people believe it or not, whichever shape they think of the earth. Right. But I think that we all need to consider the idea. I think Proverbs says, Proverbs eighteen thirteen that, um, you know, to judge a matter before you've looked at the information is foolish. Yeah, um, yeah, that which anyway, which was trans. People, people nail me with questions like, "Well, what's in below the surface of the Earth, et cetera?" Well, mm -hmm. Russia, I believe, has drilled eight miles deep. Right. And if the Earth were twenty five thousand miles in circumference, it might be eight thousand in diameter. Well, we can't drill well, eight thousand miles through the Earth. Well, let me. Um, we've can... only gone eight. But you see, people love to just nail me with some particular question where they're sitting on a body of information. Well, I've suspended my greater knowledge about the globe 
to my new and awakening knowledge about the flat earth. Let me, but but I'm you, building on that. But other people, I think it's just interesting. They can't let these ideas come into a conversation or think about it. it uh, cognitive dissonance, I think, is the word that, that explains when you're wondering if your world is really true, but you don't want to investigate it. I, I absolutely agree. And let me let me address the, the, the what's under it question, because that, you know, I did a clue on it. And I, I had to address it many times, which was uh, what you just said there. The deepest hole ever drilled is eight miles. Now, why is that significant? Well, if you believe in the globe, then it takes, you know, if the, if the globe is, will round up just slightly. To, the globe is 8,000 miles thick. That means it's 4,000 miles to the center. And we haven't drilled 2,000. We haven't drilled 1,000. We haven't even drilled 100. In fact, uh, 10%, I'm sorry, 1%. Of, of reaching the core would be 40 miles and we haven't even done done that we've only done a fraction and, of and we have all these textbooks that tell us about the iron core and the molten and ex all this exactly just and, made and up. that's yeah. the part and here's the part it's in the small print that things get lost and this is when science jumps the rails and it goes from science to scientism look i don't mind that you know science can do you know every anybody can practice the scientific method you come up with a theory you do experiments and and then you keep altering the theory until the experiments and the theory match. Piece of cake, the scientific method, right? And you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level? That's fine. You can do that. You want to tell me what uh, the core of the Earth is, though, at 4,000 miles when you've only drilled down a, a fraction of 1%. Oh, you got another thing coming. Uh, and, and they used to back in the day, uh, back in the old textbooks, they used to show the cross section. We've all seen the cross section of the earth with orange and yellow and, and, um, uh, white bands and this, you know, white core center, right? And before, back in the day, they used to have small print that said, oh yeah, by the way, we're just kind of guessing what's happening here. We don't actually know. It's, 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 it's just uh, uh, an estimation based on volcanic formations and stuff at the surface, right? And then one day that small print goes away. Well, there you go. You've now jumped from a fact to really your own religion. You've jumped into scientism uh, because now you're saying instead of just putting a giant question mark in the center of the earth, which is what you should do, they don't like that. So it's like, no, 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 we're just going to tell them our best guess. And the thing is, what you don't say it's your best guess. You just say that's what it is. You show that to a nine-year-old, and then that same kid sees it when he's 18. When he goes to university, he believes it in, as an absolute fact. So don't tell me. And then, and then on top of that, you have the audacity to say, oh, yeah, here's what the core of Mars looks like and Jupiter and Saturn and all these other things. It's like, what are you talking about? You don't even know what, what, what Earth looks like. So, no, no, sorry, not buying it, not, not for, and it, it, this happens time and time and time again. You're saying, well, no, they don't, science isn't corruptible, you know, that's the part that, like, you know, they aren't, they can't be corrupted like business and politics and entertainment and sports. They can't be corrupted like that. And it's like, really? How many times have we seen science rush products to market for the money? How many times? Happens all the time. Uh, I'll just give you some quick ones off the top of my head, going all the way back. Uh, lead paint lead gasoline uh ddt if you guys don't remember what that was that used to kill mosquitoes and it almost killed the bald eagle uh asbestos really great product actually unless you work in the factory then you're dead uh and then all the scientists that took the money to tell us that cigarettes were just fine because scientists need porsches too all right don't tell me that science isn't corruptible don't don't have neil degrasse tyson come on television and tell me that science is true whether or not you believe in it it's one of the most arrogant things i've ever heard in my life science makes mistakes here's the difference though if i make a mistake people's feelings are hurt if science makes a mistake people die lots of them and it happens all the time and so don't and and yet because they wear the white coat because they come out, you know, they smile for the cameras and, and you know, say they've made discoveries and they hide behind universities and, and their they publication. Have little clipboards. Yeah, they, they hide have behind little the clipboard. Clipboards. They they get away with it. And, you know, like for example, you know, the, the not to not to harp on the tobacco companies, but the so the tobacco companies pay out millions and millions billions of dollars, I think, in settlements. And yet the scientists you never heard about the scientists that were the ones that helped them in court. You never heard about the ones that, you know, that went on, you know, even the guys that took the white coats and went on the television commercials, you know, four out of five doctors prefer, you know, Winston or Camel or whatever it was. It was just, I'm sorry, science, science has a responsibility. Let me, let me use this real quick.
Um, and I don't want to dwell on it because I know you got more questions out there. Um, uh, George Orwell wrote a wonderful quote, and I put it in, in, in all the description boxes of every video that I make. Uh, he was talking about the responsibility of science. And it was interesting because he talked about the globe. He wasn't a flat earther, but he was talking about the globe. Because you go onto the street and ask anyone how they know the world is a globe. They will all say the same thing. The initially knee-jerk reaction will go, well, we know. It's, it's a given fact. And then you push them and you say, well, how do you know? And then they get angry. And the reason why, and, and he goes, he was, he was really talking about the responsibility of science. And he thought that was interesting. Now, the reason why I mentioned that quote is because that quote was written in 1946. How did everybody in the world in 1946 know it was a globe? It wasn't because of NASA. NASA wasn't even formed until 1958. How did they know 12 years earlier that it was a globe? They knew because scientists told them. That's all. It's all it takes. The men in the white coats to publish something in a newspaper and say, this is what the world looks like. And then you throw in some conditioning through movies. Remember, like Universal Studios, they've been using that globe icon long before NASA started. Heck, they had a biplane flying around their globe in the early versions of that. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, how the journey to where we are now has been a very interesting one, but not completely surprising. So, sorry, anyway, Mark, I ramble. Questions? Uh, Mark, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, it seemed to me, I've been following this subject for some time now, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like the web is kind of, um, or something in the web is trying to shut down the uh, proliferation of interest in this subject. Mm. Uh, in other words, like, I, I used to... I have a subscription to your your site or, or your web channel, or your your YouTube channel, right? And to for churches, and I used to. They started doing these pop-ups uh, on, on my screen of whenever there's a new post, mm -hmm. and uh, and they stopped that. Yeah, uh, it's and yeah. I got pop-ups from other things like Facebook, right? And you don't block Facebook. But. I used to think, and we've had different people. Uh, look at it and, and say, okay, are they trying to stop us and aren't they? And what I've kind of come up, the analogy I've come up with is more like a, like a forest fire. If you've ever dealt with people that have fought, you know, fire teams that have, that have, that have st tried to stop. And that is forest fires. You butt up against some places and other places, you know, other sections you let run, you let them burn out. And in our case, they seem to be doing a little bit of both where we in the, in the beginning, we got very little resistance against this uh you know considering google owns youtube and has for a while now uh you know google would recommend it now part of it was because of the money uh that you know google makes quite a bit of money off of flat earth because we are metrics people that get into flat earth watch a ton of flat earth videos and they lose a lot of sleep uh but at the same time yeah and so we yeah we have saturated the lower tiers of media but the upper tiers have kind of kept us at a distance uh you know like abc nbc cbs fox cnn they've all kind of kept us at, at arm's length they won't run primetime stories uh the first documentary the first mainstream documentary is just coming out now we just got into film festivals um television show things are being you know poked around uh but i don't i don't think it's being curbed we're, we're still too big for that uh, I mean, there's a reason why I've done hundreds of interviews and, and talked to a whole bunch of people and there's conferences and hundreds of meetups, you know, regional meetups all over the United States and just about every country you can think of. But at the same time, yeah, you, you are right. They seem to be stunting us in some ways. It's kind of like they're trying to curb our enthusiasm, but not, but, but only, you know, putting the brakes on it a little bit, not shutting it down entirely. They, they're, tr it's almost like they're, they're pacing it. Like the like they they don't want you know they're trying to slow it down enough to where maybe they're trying to buy themselves time or maybe they've got a timetable in mind not really sure yet but that's an excellent question. Thank you. Yeah. I I, I want to make a comment about the money. Mm -hmm. uh, I started the truth movement looking at nine eleven and then I've gotten to many other things income tax and flat earth mm -hmm. but. When you look back at the concept of money and the Federal Reserve and how money and currency are controlled internationally, they can just they can get scientists or doctors, they can get anybody to say anything they want. That, that's not a problem. Right. But you know, we used to think that a man spoke from his own integrity or his own research, et cetera. Now, I think some people may do it this way. 
they're paid to say some things and they're not paid to say others. So it's not so much they lie, they just emphasize where they get the money, where the grants are, et cetera. So when you understand money, then you begin to understand why things are distilled or deceptive or slanted, et cetera. But that's, that's a huge factor in the shifting of the reality, the way information is not flowing freely. Yeah, you were right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. There's, again, with anything in social media, it's being manipulated in some way, shape or form. Uh, what exactly it's doing, that's part of what, you know, part of what I'm trying to find out. Every day I look at the chessboard and I try to kind of anticipate what's going on. Uh, but it's been interesting to watch. Uh, like, for example, they recommended us for so long. You know, we're recommended, you know, in on the YouTube sidebar so many times. And we were filled in the autofill in Google so many times, whether the earth is flat. I mean, uh, I saw so many people that got into flat earth because it was recommended to them in YouTube. And that's really easy to shut down if you want. I was, look, I was in development for a while. I can tell you, it's really, really easy. Uh, but at the same time, they did something about a month ago, which which surprised me, and that was I used to be able to track the numbers. You know, when you go into any search engine, you type in something like potato salad, and it'll it'll list you know number of search results. And they did the same thing in YouTube. I mean, this is Internet 101. Search results has been there literally since the internet's been there. And we were tracking higher than most of your mainstream stuff to where uh, earlier this year we passed the president of the United States uh, in terms of popularity, you know, trending popularity. We be were beating them 20.9 to 20.8 million. And I actually made a, a, a headline along those things um, saying that, you know, we Flat Earth catches the pre president of the United States. And then just a few weeks later, somebody uh, lets me know. They say, by the way, the scoreboard's gone. And I go, oh, you mean it's wrong? He goes, no, it's gone. And I go, what are you talking about? And you go into YouTube now and you type in any topic. There used to be a line underneath it. It said search results equals a number. That's gone now. It's It's been removed entirely. And the, and people say, well, you're delusional if you think that's because of Flat Earth. I'm going, really? Because we were one of the only people that was tracking that number on a daily, if not hourly basis. And now that, that number is gone. And so nobody gets to look at it. They can only look at it in Google Analytics outside of YouTube. I thought that was fascinating. So... Anyway, that's particularly interesting, Mark, because what I see in the world is that most people go where most of the action is. I tend to run in the opposite direction, but when a thing becomes popular, the way it goes. But when somebody says something unusual or different, people just avoid it until it's popular. Right. Um, so the thinking game is the whole thing that, that um, you know, is our future. And a lot of people are just uh, conditioned that authorities have to make all decisions and speak all true. All, facts and, and we can't get in the game but really we can we yeah just need to understand oh yeah it. i've i've never seen a topic and i don't care what what you're talking about you know uh uh 9 11 jfk pearl harbor sandy hook uh every major major american war i don't care what topic it is i've never seen a, a conspiracy uh line affect in real time the world like this where there's actually things happening against us you know like there was no blue marble shot uh, from 1972, we start we we start complaining that there's no blue marble shot. I actually put it, you know, in my clues. And what do you have? What do you? Well, lo and behold, summer of 2015. Oh, by the way, the second blue marble shot ever. Uh, and you know, and they were really clear about publishing it to, to where we noticed. I don't why the reason I'm not sure. I mean, to where Scott, uh, Obama tweeted it and NASA tweeted it and and um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about it. And the press release was actually written by Scott Kelly from the space station it's like really you're writing about a, a you know a second blue marble shot from the space station that was fascinating um i've never seen you know every other little thing that happens in social media it's they seem to be trying to figure out what to how to tie, kind of like turn this like a giant ship in a certain direction i don't know really if they're having the the effect that they want um even today for example the the kyrie irvie thing that happened, you know, one of the um, National Basketball Association's best players. Uh, they, he he made an apology to the science teachers. Didn't say he was backing off of flat Earth. Didn't even say mention flat Earth at all, or that he was going back to the globe. But he was this guy, you know, he was this basketball player that said he was a flat Earther about eighteen months ago. And a lot of science te high school inner city high school science teachers just took a beating for it because you had all these young kids that were basketball fans they're more basketball fans they are science fans yelling at the teachers you know calling them out saying globe Kyrie thinks it's flat 
you know, and, and so he, Mark, apo- he apologized to them. But in doing Mark, so. In, in our state, I have written to one science teacher in each of all of our high schools and all of our colleges, and I've done that a couple of times. I don't expect to pay me any attention initially, but I'm just on that theme to write him a letter about things in space. Sure. Um, do you have comments about the space station and or... By the way, if anybody else has questions, just throw them out here. We'll, we'll oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ISS, and I'll, I'll try to do them rapid fire because I know we've only got uh, half an hour. Well, so. well the space station and, and satellites in general. Go okay, ahead. Um, let's let's look at the space station. Satellites don't concern me too much because most of them, if you, you want to look at satellites, look at the high-altitude NASA balloon projects. There's wonderful video of those have been going on since the 1950s. Uh, use hydrogen instead of helium in some cases because you can get amazing lift with hydrogen, uh, you know, as long as you don't carry people it's probably fine you know remember the hindenburg the um uh and they can carry payloads upwards of four tons you know that's eight thousand pounds and they can keep them up there for a very long time and you're saying okay what's your point my point is if you can do that with pennies on the dollar i mean a weather balloon a giant weather balloon is cheap right that is cheap why would you ever put a satellite on a rocket ever which means why would you ever put a satellite on a rocket ever so what what are the rockets doing probably nothing they're just sucking money um, but when it comes to the ISS, that's the big one. The ISS, there is so much fun stuff to look at. Uh, we have broken the ISS in so many ways. Uh, one, of course, is the vacuum of space. Let, let's look at the physics involved. And that is you're talking about aluminum and plastic that is supposedly under the stress of a pure vacuum, a negative 9 or negative 11 tor or whatever it is, you know, vacuum force is measured in tor, T-O-R-R. And that, that fuselage should just blow apart. And yet, 19 years it's been up there. No one's ever had any problems with it. There's never been a leak. Nobody's ever died. In fact, the, the astronauts don't even wear spacesuits. They they float around in khakis and polo shirts and socks. They don't even wear shoes. Uh, and there's so many things. Uh, the production value on the inside of that space station is horrible. Um, let me I, let me let me do just a quick one. Um, I, I mean, I could reference a whole bunch of videos. Uh, one, if you're listening, you're writing stuff down. Uh, um, oh crap! I can't remember the guy's name off the top. You know what? Let's just go with the ISS hairspray. That's an easy, easier one. Look up ISS and then hairspray, and that is it. it made perfect sense because even if you were doing, regardless if you're using a gravity simulator like the the vomit comet, you know the the parabolic flights where you can you know take a plane up and then you nose dive it and you're falling about the same place as the, it simulates zero g, right? Uh, but also, you in, in if you're using green screen, you have to deal with women's. It's going to sound weird. You have to deal with women, women, women's hair differently than you would with anything else in a production value. And here's why: first off, you shouldn't even have hair if you're on the ISS because you're using air filtration systems. It's no different than a swimming pool. Long hair, any hair of any length, should be just abolished. People should be wearing surgical caps at all time. Your hair should be completely shaved at all times. And you, you should, no one should ever, ever have long hair. But women up there had long hair all the time. It was it didn't seem to be an issue. It's like, really? Because if one breaks apart, you're going to be f- floating through those things. It would be like floating through spider webs because they're just going to be flying around. And yet they, so if you're going to show a woman in zero G on, on the ISS, okay, what do you do, right? Well, you got to do something with the hair because the hair is going to float around like it's in a swimming pool, right? You know, it's just going to float around. Literally, it's just going to be floating to, to all sides. So how, but, but you're faking it. So how do you, how do you counteract that? The first way, of course, is to put a hat on them. Right, that's the easiest way. Just put a freaking hat on or shave off their hair so you don't have to deal with it or put it back in a ponytail. But no, they came up with a brilliant idea. Let's let's prove it's zero G. Let's perm their hair. Let's just crank up the hairspray and turn their hair into the Bride of Frankenstein. But the problem is it doesn't move. It just sits there going straight up. Yeah, it's like, wh- wh- what's happening with their hair? Right. And they even point to it every once in a while. It's like, oh, look, here's zero G. It's like, no, zero G. That's not how hair works in zero G. Zero G, your hair actually floats. It doesn't sit there like a bunch of corn stalks. Right. It doesn't just, just oh, it's just horrible. Uh, there, oh, I'm sorry. The, the guy I, want, I was thinking of, his name is Mike Helmick. Look up a video by a guy named Mike Helmick, H-E-L-M-I-C-K, or type in Mike Helmick Flat Earth. He does some great videos, and I think I mirrored it on my channel as well, where he shows um, uh, CGI stuff, where they're using green screen, and they're trying to, the astronauts are reaching for things that aren't there. 
uh, what the most notable one, oh, it was so brilliant, where he was his friend had a baseball cap and it looked like a real baseball cap floating end over end. And the guy reaches to grab it and he grabs it and he puts it over on the side wall. Well, the problem is he didn't grab the hat, but he went through the entire arm motions like he absolutely grabbed the hat and was putting it somewhere. And you're looking at him it's going, what, what, what happened here? What, what, what did it <laughs> and, and he just completely, you know, they glossed over it. They realized, and, and by the way, one of the reasons why you never, ever should do live footage. And I know it's like, oh, I want to, we want to talk to the school children and all this. No, 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 no. Never works out live. There's nobody does live television anymore. It's because you have mistakes. There's always, always production mistakes. So ISS, no. But do I think there's something up there? Sorry, short answer for this. Do I think there's something up there? Yes, I do. If something's flying around there, obviously. People have photographed stuff. I have looked with night vision. I can see something flying around up there. Are there any people on it? No, there are not. There are no people on this thing. It is It is a complete fabrication. It's a sham. Hey, Ted and Mark. Yeah. This is Jim in Colorado, Ted. Yes, I remember you. I hope you'd be on. Go ahead. You're, you're uh, electronic in the um, satellite world. Go ahead. Oh, cool. Well, <clears throat> Mark, I was a test conductor on the LSAT program, mm -hmm. the Apollo Lunar Experiments Package. Sure. And, and I uh, was involved in, uh, you know, everything, shake and bake, thermal vac, and all the qualifications that all this, uh, these experiments went through. Yeah. And uh, that was at Bendix Aerospace in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was involved in uh, flight qualifying, uh, flight A, uh, proto A, B, and C, and flight one and two. Now, my question is, and I'm, I'm a follower of Flat Earth, by the way. <laughs> uh, I should have I you on the, the show from time to time. <laughs> I've looked at the evidence. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, where does all this equipment go? You know, these, these satellites that they flight qualify, do they... Do they launch those on these stratospheric balloons? Is that how they do that? Well, or? you could you could do it one of two ways. Um, and and I'll, I'll mention to you a quick story. Uh, I had a chance, uh, well, it was at least a year ago now, uh, to talk with a company, one of SpaceX's rivals, and they, they deal with uh -huh. boost, boosters. It was called Interorbital out of uh, Northern California. And the and I was I didn't even want to call them. There was a German television company that wanted me to talk to these guys because they were curious. Because I said, well, if you're launching rockets, if it was me and I wanted to commandeer everything, I would make sure that if you were a private company, that NASA would eventually want all the telemetry and everything that has to do with the package, and 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 you you would you would you would have to do that because you'd take over this basically take it over once it got to a certain altitude and and you'd. There's one of two ways you could do it, but I was it was curious because I said, "Do you do you have to register what your your launch with NASA?" And they said, "No, we don't." And they said, "But it's an interesting question because we do have to register with a government group." And they said, "In every co corp every corporation in every country has this group they have to register with." I go, "Who is it?" And they said, "And hopefully I get the name right." They said, "It was the Atmospheric and Transportation Safety Bureau," and you have you have to send them every little detail of the package i mean everything about the rocket everything about the payload everything about the transmissions and the whole nine yards so to answer your question what would you do with it at that point is one of two ways you could do it you could either yes you could use a one of the high altitude balloons and take an identical whatever it is and put it up there and and have them beam it against that or, or show them you know whatever it is you, you make sure they were pointing to that at a certain point that would be kind of problematic or you just feed them the data however you know you send to their dish directly from one of your dishes i don't know exactly mm -hmm. um but wherever but yeah the rockets would be wasted um one of my the stories i like telling is uh, my next door neighbor was a guy um and i don't know if you'd remember him if you guys have pe know all the people ahead of you um a uh, guy his name was wayne ottinger and he was like the garage mechanic for back in the day. You know, he knew all the Gemini and Mercury and Apollo guys. And and mm -hmm. uh, he knew nothing. And that is, you know, look, the people that turn the wrenches, they don't have to know anything. You know, they build the rock. Do they do legitimate work? Yes, absolutely. You know, they, they build the satellites and put them on the rockets and the rockets go up and you dump the rockets out off in the drink somewhere. Lord knows there's plenty of ocean to choose from. Uh, and well, then uh, I, I was ahead. listening to uh, a radio uh, internet radio program here a couple weeks ago yeah and this lady that lived on the coast north of cape kennedy yeah said when they have a launch down there 
<clears throat> the rocket comes up, and she lives like, oh, I don't know, it's like 20 or 30 miles, I think, north of the uh, north of the Cape right. on the coast. Uh, she's been out in the yard and sees the rocket come parallel to the coast and then go out to sea. And she says that that's the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing to me. And people that are that don't know if you're, you're hearing this for the first time, when a rocket goes up and I don't care if you're talking about escape velocity or not. It should keep, it should keep going vertical for a lot right. lot lot longer. I mean, if you want to roll it over eventually, sure. But the fact that you can time lapse that rollover from the launch pad, you know, with an with a camera, you know, and, and you know the people, you know, civilians doing this all day long. It's like, oh yeah, look, there's the rocket trail. It looks like it's going, you know, perfectly horizontal by the time it gets up to like 20, 30 miles. It's like, why Why would you ever do that? Uh, it, it's just staggering to me. You know, and it doesn't matter what you're talking about, whether it's um, uh, small satellite payloads or the space shuttle or, you know, the SpaceX stuff. The trajectory is always the same. You know, it goes up right. a little ways and then, it, you know, it arcs over. And again, I, I've heard rumors of um, of a booster graveyard. Uh, you could look that up if you get a chance where they say, oh, yeah, we dumped the boosters out in this place and there's this like the most remote place in the in the south in the south pacific uh the the furthest away you can go from land anywhere apparently uh where they dump the boosters and it's like oh why not dump everything out there so well, that's where they dumped uh, the 9-11 buildings probably <laughs> hey you know what that's, that's the first time i've heard that and i may steal that that's good <laughs> yeah um i uh, i used to uh fly this, these experiments, you know, the, the flight uh, experiments uh, individually, like the, the uh, all some of them were like uh, solar wind experiment. You know, they would uh, put me on a plane right. in Michigan, and I would fly back to the subcontractor, you know, if they had problems with these, the, these uh, experiments. Uh, they'd put it in a box, I'd take it on the plane, set it in the seat next to me, put a strap on it, and then, of course, that's when the stewardesses would come down the line and check to see if you had a ticket. Right. And I'd hand her my ticket, and two of them. And she'd say, well, you know, this box is going to have to go under the seat. You know, it it's, was insured by Lloyd's of London for a million bucks. For right. one of these that I took. And uh, it was kind of comical that I couldn't uh, put it under the seat and that the thing had a, a ticket, a paid-for ticket, and then she would strap it in and, you know, I'd go on my merry way, but wow. Yeah, I was a hard, I was a hard nut to crack on this because I was involved. I was right in the middle of it, you know. Sure, I, and I don't, I don't blame. Look, I don't know how hard you were compared to. I mean, you would have been hard, no question. It took me nine months, uh, mm. but but I had so much less material to work off of, and I was kind of doing the whole connect the dot thing. Whereas I wasn't focusing on any one particular thing, I was I was all over the place trying to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna shotgun pattern it, and if I find anything that doesn't point back to flat Earth, then I'll I'll know I have a problem. And it started to scare me after the first five or six things. They all just kept pointing back to the same thing. It's like no, and I I was bang. I remember literally banging my head on the keyboard at one point, going, "There's no way." There's no way because you you feel like you've been you've been a part of you've been punked in some sort of street magic trick, you know, like you were a victim of a three card Monty, you know, a really bad version. <laughs> and I I had no it, but then but it it rang so here, here's the part and I, I don't want to you know I'd, I'd love to get another question before we go but I got to make this sure. point and the, the the thing that got me was when I when I turned it into a thought experiment I was saying okay. Let's let's just say that that this is the crazy thing. Let's say this is right. How would I hide one? How would I build the world if I was going to do it like this? And then how would I hide it? You know, how would I keep it hidden from the people? You know, let again. Let's say you you um, you were the government that figured it out in 1960. How would you hide it? How would you keep that secret? You know, uh, you know, cloaked for 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 the next f several decades. And every move they made, every single move was really good. It was about as best as you could come up with at the time. And in fact, I couldn't come up with a better one. Uh, you know, did I disagree with some of them as far as you know what you know the the, the morals or the ethics behind it? Sure. Uh, but the tactics were pretty solid 
to where, you know, even now, you know, the, it, we here in 2018 and no one's ever questioned why we never went back to the moon. <laughs> you know, you know, nobody's ever. It's like we keep every couple months like, oh, yeah, we're going to. In fact, there was a story that came out today that said uh, um, we're, you know, that whole space elevator. The story says, oh, it's going to happen sooner than you think. And and I read the article and it says, uh, oh, yeah, the Americans were thinking they could get it done by 2050, but China thinks they can do it by 2045. And it's like, that's where you came up with that headline? Really? 2045? People don't remember what happened six months ago. You think they're going to remember this story in a year? But anyway, sorry. Yeah, this is the granddaddy of all hoaxes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, this is... you, gen you gentlemen were talking about how quickly you adapted to the flat earth. I did it in 90 minutes watching each of Mark's 11 videos. Now, I, I accepted what he said, but I've spent certainly 100 hours or more since exploring it through other books and other resources. But in sure. 90 minutes, I was pretty much committed to the, um, to the concept because I think your videos are so concise and focused, Mark. I think they're just great. Well, thank you. I think, again, it was, it was really more of a... Uh, and it means a lot that you said that. Uh, it, 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 I just kind of came up with the dummies guide. Uh, and it mostly was because of my training, my career training. I used to do software training for uh, blue collar factories back in the day. And I and I would have to boil down some really complex software into, you know, blue collar factories. And, you know, just like, OK, here's how you use it. And when I looked at this, I just kept boiling flat earth down and down and down until finally I said, you know what? I'm just going to throw out the math. We're not even going to talk about math. We're gonna, just going to say, okay, here's where I think this dot leads to this dot leads to this dot. And if it goes smoothly enough, at least now it was a lot of people, it's like it didn't convince them, but it, it it's the gateway drug to the other stuff to where they, you know, they jump from my, you know, again, I'm the, the if Flat Earth is a university, I'm the freshman recruiter. And they went from my stuff into the more advanced stuff to where now... Uh, people have come up with some amazing things that I would have never ever right. thought of. So, but thank you for that. Yeah, well, there's a there's a lot one, one with the. Uh, about me, one point about me converting in 90 minutes was I've spent 10 years looking at 9/11, Oklahoma City bombing, Waco. I mean, I was already primed to know that by thinking and reason and research, you can determine things that are different than you've always known. Sure. Now, most people don't have that position now, and flat Earth. I think it's too big a thing for people to start with. They, they need to warm up with some of the lesser conspiracies. Yeah. But ultimately, I think that the layman can deal with the flat earth, but they just have to get in and deal with the information. Yeah, I agree. I'm sorry. What, what, what about the 501c3 church? We need to get them to deal with it because it's biblical. It is. I got, and I should comment on that before we we wrap this up eventually, because the the biblical side is very very important of this, which is there are a lot of pastors out there. Look, at least first off, for those people that are listening, at least half, at least half of the the flat Earth community is uh, biblically based, right? Especially in the United States. Uh, I can't speak too much for other countries, but I know in the United States, at least half of them, uh, at least the conferences and meetups are, are you know the very very strong Christians. Um, that being said, there are a lot of pastors out there that are in very precarious positions, much like the science teachers of the inner cities, where uh, all of a sudden they've got people coming to them and saying, OK, what about Flat Earth? What about Flat Earth? You know, and, and for a lot of people, it's like, you know, they've heard you know, the same stories over the years. You go to church, you, you know, you hear the same stuff. So this is very, very interesting to them. It's like, hey, what's your opinion, pastor, on this? And it's tough because if you're a pastor, do you risk alienating your congregation potentially by bringing it up? Do you kind of softball it in there? How do you work it in? Because, you know, if you're a Bible literalist, eh, you look, it's, it's a flat earth book. I hate to say it, but it is. There's only one verse and everybody knows it uh, that, that goes against it. And that is Isaiah 40, 22, which says, he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And remember, in the original Hebrew, circle is not ball or sphere or globe. Circle is circle, like a dinner plate, like a hubcap, like a roulette table. A circle is a circle. And yet the, the pastors, they, they cling on to it. I mean, like with fingernails, they cling on to this. And they basically saying that Isaiah 40, 22 has veto power like it's a like it's a thing <laughs> like that's possible like it has veto power over the rest of the bible including oh i don't know genesis that that says you know the firmament separating the waters above and the waters below and there's so many examples that the ones they should throw out there one i used for a clue which was the uh, the tower of babel 
And it's like, look, if if we're sitting on a ball spinning through space, then you're talking about a needle that's stuck into an orange. What's happening there? That tower is going nowhere. Where is that Tower of Babel going? It's going nowhere. Uh, but if it's on a clo enclosed stationary surface, well, we know exactly where that tower is going. The tower is going to heaven, which is why, you know, God said in the, you know, the story, it's a brief story. He says, yeah, they're going to make it. Yeah, we can't let that happen. <laughs> and, you know, he and he dashes it. Uh, the second one, which I didn't put in, uh, which was the story of Joshua. Uh, I thought it was a fascinating story. And I remember listening to that as a kid where uh, Joshua asked the, the Lord to stop the sun and the moon in the sky, pause it in the sky so that he had more daylight so he could slay more enemies. And then that's exactly what God did. God said, yeah, you know what? Let's do that. And he, he just hit the pause button. And that was that, that was the end. Well, in a uh, an enclosed system, in a solar system, I'm sorry, that's a physics nightmare. You can't just stop the Earth and the entire soul. I mean, you could, of course, he's God. But you've stopped the Earth and solar systems, it becomes a lot more problematic. You know, there's no centrifugal force. You're having to change a whole bunch of physics. Whereas if the sky was just moving, well, you just stop the sky from moving. It's not that tough. It's way easier. I'm not saying that God's lazy. I'm saying that God's efficient. So, sorry, there's my little rant. Thank you, Mark. For, for, for me, um, I remember this one... Uh, I don't know the verse verse by per se exactly, but it, uh, Satan tempts Jesus and oh yeah 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 going going to the of, highest yeah. the highest part of the yeah, earth absolutely absolutely in, in, yeah I, and I'm like how could you do that on a on a globe right yeah let me, world, right? let me let me let me tell that I'm one sorry. really quick because there's some experiments yeah. that happened recently that that pertain to that. Uh, the, if you guys know the story, you'll look it up. I don't remember the chapter and verse, uh, which is uh, the devil takes uh, Jesus up to the highest, the highest point of the earth, which is this mythical place. But it doesn't matter it, it, where this place was. Let's say it was a mythical mountain. He takes him up on the top of this mountain and he said he could see the entire earth, everything. He could see everything. Well, if you're on a globe, you can never see everything. And yet you can. And we have seen, especially with long distance photography, especially with infrared filters nowadays, uh, you don't even have to do it at night. You can you can do it during the daytime uh, where it, it's really just high contrast black and white, but it punches through the haze. And we have done infrared uh, tests upwards of 500 miles from an airplane. You should not be able to see at 30,000 feet. You should not be able to see 500 miles. Not if it's a globe. There should be too much of a drop. Curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared. And I, this the reason why I thought this was interesting is the guy that did this test for us, he was not even aware that there was an SR-71 pilot that came out a few years ago. Not a flat earther. But he, he goes around the circuits like, yeah, I'm an SR-71 pilot. People ask me questions. And he was talking about how far, you know, because the SR-71 flies very, very high. It flies, what, 70,000, 80,000, whatever the unclassified say. But he was up there really, really high. And he was, he was talking about distances he could view which was strange. And he said, like, he could see Los Angeles from Arizona when he got up to a certain height. I like, go, wow, that's pretty amazing. But then he said, not only that, and I thought it was an exaggeration because why, why not? Why not tell a fish story? He said that when he was down in Arizona, he could look up the Rocky Mountains and see the Rocky Mountains all the way to Canada. I was going, wow, that's incredible because the air was so thin, he could actually see that far. Well, he didn't realize. It's like, no, it doesn't matter how thin the air is or not. I go, that's too far a distance. That should be over the curvature of the earth. It should be behind the hill. And so his stories are pretty much matching up with our infrared photography that we're throwing out there. And he's not even a flat earther. So yeah, good stuff. Anyway, what else? Who else is out there? Um, I want to make a comment back to Jim again, talking about the church's involvement. Yeah. I recently read a book. I met the author, um, David Shaftcook. The book is uh, Unmasked. Christianity unmasked. Yeah. But anyway, he talks about the problem with the church is they're accepting their corporate status, they're accepting the, the IRS discount, um, they're accepting the Federal Reserve System. Yeah, the church is just all intertwined with the with the pagan world around us. Um, <laughs> that, that's our problem. Uh, it 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 does have yeah they look and and I'm not going I, I don't want to end this on a on a bad note but as you know. Corruption, men, men can be corrupted anywhere. Uh, when money gets involved, I don't care what industry, what part of life you're in, even the church, well, heck, the church. <laughs> 
church doesn't pay taxes what what do you think that where do you think that motivation came from uh you know they they well, like but the thing is i don't think any of us should pay taxes but the church gets a discount so they say the rest of us should pay right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah i i hear you i hear you i mean i do i do believe that there is a lot of good people you know in the church obviously uh it tends you know like anything um power corrupts and when men get to a certain level uh, you know, of course, I can't say that pastors need Porsches too because they can't. Uh, you know, they, well, they... I agree that they're good people in the church, and I, I would even go so far as to say they have no idea of their error. Right. They don't understand it's a flat Earth, and that we need to get down to reality and see right. that God is near and about us. They, they're working on a script that they were told was true, and you know, the, the good. They, so many people are. What I find is college people, educated people, or people with house salaries are so stuck in their own world, they've lost their ability to simply see things before them. Right. Yeah, it, it is true. Uh, the people, it, it's more, again, it's conditioning. And I've tried to say, like, look, if you have a master's degree in any physical science, you are not going to be able to get this. You, you were ev exactly. eventually you're just going to have to wait until the mainstream media beats you over the head with it because the you're you're, you're just, you've got too much you know that's too I, I won't say orwellian conditioning but look you're, you know you're committed to the other side yeah. yeah i mean remember the the globe is shown to you when you're six years old it's just put in your classroom and if you just go through high school that's 12 years you know 12 years of that object being in the corner of your classroom you know year after year i mean the cia pays top dollar for that sort of conditioning and you got it for free. And then if you go to um, to postgrad, if you do uh, just a normal bachelor's degree, that's more four more years of even more intense stuff, especially in a physical science. Uh, but we are snapping more people out of it every day, and you know we're still waiting for more academics to come at us. But it, so far, it's been a, a bang up here. Uh, anyway, I, we're, we'll probably have to wrap this up. What's uh, what that's what fun. final thoughts do you want to do? Well. If if there are any questions, fine. You just make a summary and you go away if you like, and some of us will remain and talk to okay. each other. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, thank you, thank you guys in advance uh, for everyone's listened so far. And and normally I would probably go longer, but I've I've got my own show I've got to do here in a little bit, and I gotta I gotta take a little break. Um. Uh. So the summary is this: Look, don't everything I've told you so far. Anyone that's listened uh, at this level. Don't believe a word I say, right? I'm not here to convince you. I am not here to persuade you. I am just here to let you know what is happening out there in social media, uh, what is happening out there in the internet. Uh, it, flat Earth is not a joke. I, for whatever reason, it's coming back in a really, really big way. Uh, and you're going to start, if you, if you think I'm kidding, just start typing into any search engine and look around. Um, my stuff, you know, of course is a, is a great gateway to it, but there is so much content out there. Uh, you could spend the rest of your natural life sifting through it and you're, you're never going to get through it. Um, I've, I've created a great little list on YouTube called the Flat Earth Shortlist for new people. It's a collection of all different people that have, that have done Flat Earth content. If you're into the biblical stuff, I'm a huge fan of, uh, Rob Skiba's work. Uh, he does a, a great website called testingtheglobe.com. Uh, if you, again, if you're in a chapter and verse, that's where I, I direct you at first. And then after that, you know, just be, you know, try to stay open minded, you know, because it's, it's not going away. It's, it's going to be everywhere. Um, and if you need any more information from me, all my contact information, just type in flat earth clues into any search engine. You'll eventually get to me, uh, all my contact info, including my, uh, my name and my address and my phone number. They're all out there. I'm easy to find if you have any follow up questions, but other than that, thank you, thank you for, for having me and giving me this opportunity.